Welcome to the Sweet Science of Finding podcast. Today, we have Angus Ross. Welcome, Angus. Thanks, James. Yeah, happy to be here. And I, I appreciate you coming on. I actually wanted to start this podcast when I was saying to your colleague, uh, Bill Smart, the, uh, the other day that your sprints presentation, I think it, was, it must have been in 2011 or 2012 on the, on the overshoot yeah. phenomenon, yep. as what well spurred yep. my master's research and, and published right. it. We, we tried to do... We tried to do an overshoot with the Warriors there as part oh, of their okay. preseason. Yep. And instead of obviously not, not taking muscle biopsies and actually seeing actual muscle fiber type change, we kind of used the power force velocity profile mm-hmm. just to see if we see that overshoot in velocity and we could by proxy maybe estimate that yeah. it was a type 2x overshoot. But we didn't see that, but we did see huge improvements in like force power, etc. Probably because it was like a really solid deload for them before going into the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but super interesting stuff. And maybe we can just start with uh, a little bit of what you're doing currently, and then we can maybe just go straight into overshoot and we can just go from there. Cool. Okay. So currently uh, working for High Performance Sport New Zealand, I work with a variety of sort of athletes. Um, I'm sort of nominally employed in uh, track and field athletics, um, but um, I end up dabbling in a few other businesses. I, I work with one one rower, um, one beach volleyball player, one squash player, um, was working with a tennis player, so kind of in a variety of bits and pieces. Um, so my role is largely in a sort of um, two things. I, I work in a conditioning, you know, strength and conditioning, you know, um, sports science related role, and then I also have a role in pathways, which is more of a youth development thing, which is um, kind of an interesting space as well in terms of that sort of long term uh, athlete development space. So um, yeah, pretty lucky in my role in terms of stuff I enjoy and um, yeah, good. Right, oh, perfect. Let's let's just go straight into this overshoot phenomenon. Mm-hmm. I, yep. I believe it was that was it that Great Britain cycling team that kind of brought it to light back two thousand or something? Well no, not really. well, they they inadvertently discovered it, but it had been discovered sort of twenty years earlier, I suppose. Yeah. I, I, the thing that this happened for me was I, I was on a I was at a conference randomly and the Great Britain sports scientist who who I actually knew personally, we're having a you know, having a beer at a conference as you do, and um, he sort of t- started explaining about one of their uh, superstar athletes had had done you know broken a world record, um, sort of nine or t- ten weeks post uh, ceasing strength training, and they were really amazed because they they had to repeat for this next thing, so they couldn't start a big strength reload again, and he had some time off and broke this world record. And I said, oh, yeah, that's the overshoot phenomenon, which is what my PhD was. And the basic idea is that period of strength training, um, particularly high rep strength training, this traditional sort of yeah. more high pitch feed into the spectrum, you will um, down-regulate your 2x myosin, which is your fastest sort of contractile protein, and you get a shift towards, at least a shift towards 2a, which is a sort of more um, fatigue-resistant fast switch, but not quite as fast switch muscle. And the overshoot phenomenon is when you cease training, if you cease training again after that, um, you, you rest, which is a which is a, seems to be a stimulus for um, two x proliferation. Becomes normal rest becomes super rest because you've adapted to this period of high volume training. And then, so you kind of overshoot the the proportion of of two x muscle, which is um, you know uh, produced. And so then you get these subsequent effect as you sort of, you sort of alluded to before. You get this improvement in um, high velocity power output, and you know that's the most sports you know be it a, you know a, a, a running sprinting a striking sport you know martial arts all mm-hmm. these things it's it's generation of high seed power is, is is often the the um the bit that you know that's the shit that will kill them you know that's the that's the <laughs> stuff that you know that that is gives you that edge and so um yeah really interesting area and certainly um i think a lot in certain cycling they had this sort of inadvertent discovery and i often laugh there's a couple of examples that you know obviously work in athletics predominantly and there's a couple of sort of famous examples from track and field where people have been injured and or had a virus, Epstein-Barr virus or, you know, glandular fever, t- take six months off, come out and they break a world record um, on, a modic- on a modicum of training post that. So not enough training to depress their um, fiber type back to what it was. But yeah, and, and it's like, and, and we see this time and time again, the coaches don't know what the hell's happening going on and, and, and oftentimes. And, um, you know, there, there are one or two coaches that, that, use this as a um strategic policy in their training if you like yeah it, often often coaches just you know i'll oh, be just strict training and, and it's very basic and it's kind of this linear progression but um yeah you can do quite drastic um interventions 
and in strength training is this very potent stimulus for um, affecting fiber type that people don't mm. necessarily give it credit for. And and and, and you know, you know you're obviously involved in in the martial arts world and, and striking sports. You get these you know amazingly high speed contractile. Um, you know, I'm not sure how many um, degrees per second you're getting at the shoulder or the elbow or, or and a punch, but it, it would be yeah extremely high. And so the ability to, to generate that quickly, fiber type is one of the precursors to, to high speed power. And yeah, I, there are some interesting things to do do, do there, and then trying to combine that with enough fatigue resistance not to be a 10 mm. second one that is, is your <laughs> you know you, it's, it's a it's a really interesting puzzle that's my that's what makes sport, sport exciting i reckon that you, you've got to to try and mix and meld these two different sim, three four or five different simile and you know, skill work endurance work conditioning speed um and try and find this ultimate human um at the end of it um which is yeah it's, yeah, <laughs> that's what sports great uh, in my mind i love that stuff <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love that. You mentioned about the coaches that use actually use an overshoot protocol. Yeah, I mean, I think the old research from was it Anderson and Agar was like complete bed rest for three months. I'm I'm assuming they're not going complete bed rest in there. No, no, no. But there's a, there's a guy. Um, the first coach I came across that was actually using it strategically was a guy called Nelio Mora, a Brazilian coach, who's also actually a PhD in exercise physiology. It's like okay, this guy's any. And in the 2008 Olympics, he had the gold medalists in the men's long jump and the women's long jump. Yeah, you know, mm. from from South America is like, oh, this guy's onto it, and so and he uses he had a protocol where he would um and was, I've kind of adopted a similar um yeah sort of plagiarized some of his ideas um uh, and as far as he would do period of strength training he'd never go longer than three months of heavy strength training was part mm-hmm. of his thing because he didn't want to depress it to the ultimate depression that he could get to, and then he would have um he was strength training so in a in an, in an athletic season. You know they have all these competitive um, events that are Diamond League and all these bits and pieces where they they earn money. So that these guys are professional athletes. So that he would do he was basically cease strength training, start of the season, and then just do one. I think he had one strength session every two weeks, um, just to maintain those fight and a low volume of strength, non fatiguing, and then and then he goes through the season, do really make some money at all these events, and then he might have a ten day reload in the middle of the season when up the last Diamond League before the World Champs, and he's got still got six or eight weeks yeah and then and then he would do 10 days of reload stress the system but again it's only 10 days so it's not going to compromise the crap out of it but but it gets that builds that strength back up and so you're trying to maintain those qualities and then taper into a thing and he did, did it very strategically and it's certainly he's, he's, he's published and stuff on that space um in the coaching literature at least maybe not in the hardcore science but um his results in a in a highly competitive event like like mm. long jump um speak for themselves it was, it's quite nice to see a, a coach with a science background, um, you know, leading the world in that space, which which I, I found it really interesting. I certainly have used some of that stuff with athletes subsequently. How, did you did you adapt it for your or how did you adapt it for your situation? Well, so I, I initially started using it with I was working in skeleton, which is a winter yeah. Olympic sport, um, which is essentially it's, it's a forty meter sprint um, with then going down face first down a down a hill, um, but the the forty meter sprint. And dictate something like forty or fifty percent of the variance in performance. So that's a really critical part of it. You want to have a fast push time. And so we, we did exactly that. We would we would we basically stole his protocol. We we would um do lots of strength and get really strong really strong pre season. Um the early season push results would be slightly compromised because you would be certainly a two in my mind a two A monster rather than a two X monster. And then you get better and better bit season. Then over Christmas there was a couple of weeks off for um between World Cups and we'd 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 reload for ten days. And then get back and taper into world champs, and, and, and that would all work out pretty well. Um, in general terms, it's certainly the same thing with, um, you know, I've used it with shot putters as well uh, at a world level, at middle medalists at a world level. And, you know, again, that's a, that's a, you know, a loaded striking sport, you could argue. And mm-hmm. um, because they're that, throwing a seven kilo implement, um, there's quite a high strength demand. So we, we wouldn't have done it as dramatically, perhaps, as um, they might have done for a long jumper, which is, Further down that sort of force velocity spectrum, um, and so we'd keep a little bit of strength in the whole, but we'd drop it dramatically from four or five gym heavy gym sessions, two hour gym sessions a week, to you know, two thirty minute sessions a week, and yeah, okay. with an emphasis on high speed power. But it was still become it was relative rest, if you like. Um, and again, I, I feel like um, you you need to accept you're going to probably lose some force qualities, like that the, the peak strength will will decline some, somewhat. Once you oh, yeah. once you remove that stimulus, 
uh, and that's okay um, as long as you've got enough. And so what we found was as, as an athlete gets older and stronger, and let, let's say, I'm going to pull numbers out of my, my backside here, but <laughs> if you said, you know, you, you needed to have a, to throw a 22 meter shot put, say you need to have a 200k bench press. These are all made up numbers, but 200k bench is, is the minimum, let's say. And so, so if, if you get up to a 250k bench press in the off season, well, you might be able to go 12 weeks and still be above 200 kilos without doing any strength training. That, right. you know, or, or only a modicum of strength training. Um, but all that time, your high speed power is going up while your peak force is, is declining marginally. And so at some point, there'll be a, a peak power you know, after X number of weeks. And the, and the stronger you are, perhaps the longer you can go um, with this low volume or, 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 or minimal strength training and still be um, improving high speed power. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's. There's always going to be an art in this stuff because, as you say, you're not mm. likely to be doing biopsies and, and doing these other bits and pieces. And you've got to, um, and there's other training stresses obviously mitigate changes. It's not bed rest, as you say, from the original uh, sort of pace where you just sit around and do nothing. Um, <laughs> so, so it's, it's you, you, you're not going to, um, you, you, know, you need to be in touch with your athlete and see what's happening and, and, and keep a track on things and um, trying to find that perfect time course is, is you know, Depending on the demands of the sport, the gifts the athlete has, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think in the, in the original stuff, like mm-hmm, Jesper Anderson, who did the original Anderson Lego paper mm. at the start of his PhD, he found that there were some responders and some non responders to the overshoot uh, in his PhD. And, and one of the things was the people that had naturally really, really low levels of 2X muscle, your, your classic slow twitch sort of phenotype. Yeah. Um, Work, workhorses. Yeah. They didn't really respond to it anyway. So if they had nothing, mm. they didn't. Know, they, they overshot from nothing to two times nothing and still nothing. You know, like. Um, <laughs> but but most of the athletes oh. that I work with in the sort of the power land sports, I don't see those animals because they don't they don't even get in the door. You know, so mm. um, yeah. I mean, I guess there's 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 yeah, and and possibly in, in the martial arts you see all sorts because you can have somebody who's got a much more endurance profile yeah. that's going to grind somebody down and versus a, um. So yeah, horses for courses, I suppose. It's interesting because obviously the, the examples you gave obviously it works well with them. You know, one-off events like one-off sprints, one-off throws. Yeah. Theoretically, do you think it could be applied just to say like let's say it's just striking us because that is the fastest of all the martial arts? Like just say a, a boxer. Is that something do you think that could be used there? Even though there is so much outside influence of having to do the different conditioning and yeah. obviously the high loads of technical training. Yeah, I think it's more difficult, much more difficult, and. Yeah. Um, there's some subtleties there that you kind of you can't you can't not not do the conditioning training because you, you you know you can't bank on knocking somebody out in ten seconds you know that's um, unlikely isn't it and so yeah I think those other things will compromise the whole sort of five type adaptations by doing okay I'm going for road runs every morning or doing you know, X summer conditioning or you know I'm doing you know twelve rounds of twelve three minute rounds of training whatever it is um, yeah. so so it's the fiber type piece is less um, in my mind, at least less useful in those in those sports. I think you can still deload training, and deload training, and it might not be fire type. It might be your nervous system is more um, yeah. prepared to you know express movement and power and, and high speed stuff. Um, and and I think you know the, the other mechanism which we maybe we'll get to um, for high speed power is is um, sarcomeres and series is another. So yeah, fiber yeah. type is, is one driver of it. Sarcomeres and series is another, um, which is sort of um, length of the muscle fascicle um, and we know that um, so that is less in my mind um, and it's possibly the, the way we want to go and I'm not sure I'm sure Bill maybe alluded to this when you spoke to him um, that if you added sarcomeres in series and there are papers which suggest this is possible in humans um, mm-hmm. you add sarcomeres in series you improve the um, peak contractile velocity of the muscle which striking sport happy days that's what we want um, but you do so without Compromising it metabolically in terms of you're not making more, you're not making it less oxidative. Um, mm. So it still has those endurance qualities, but just because of the length of muscle, it's it's got this higher c- contractile speed. So um, to my mind, that's like okay, win win. You know, like martial arts, fighting sports, rugby sevens. You know, you need speed and conditioning. You know, mm-hmm. and and so to my mind, it seems like an obvious thing to do. And I'm not sure how many people. Are, I think very few people are doing it. Um, Strategically going after sarcomeres and series of muscle length, um, there seems like there's there's a win win there that um, isn't well understood and probably isn't um, fully researched either. I'm, I'm probably jumping the gun a little bit from 
from what people would say in, in terms of what you can really interpret from the literature. But um, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's where we need to go as coaches is that you need to go. Well, best guess is this. The animal literature says this. You know, people won't do some of these extreme interventions with humans because it's not ethical. You can't get you know the, the <laughs> university the university yeah. ethics committee to sign off on X, Y, or Z. Um, but as you know, like most elite athletes, you know, have to be a bit obsessive, and you know. You tell a normal punter to go and do an extreme intervention, they're like, no, nah, I'm not doing that study. You tell an athlete it's going to give them a gold medal or, or a yeah, big million dollar payday, and oh, then where do I sign up? You know, they're different, they're different yeah. humans. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think there are options. There are options there, certainly. But, um, yeah. yeah. I, lo- I love that. It's really interesting. My Because my academic supervisor was Matt Brugali oh, yeah. through my master's. Yeah. Obviously, his a lot of his research was on eccentric training, especially with hamstrings. And yeah. increasing the angle of peak talks through various eccentric training uh, modalities, and that's the increased classical right. length with that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've gone deep into that too. I really love that that idea, and just the idea with, I mean, that was focused on hamstrings, but obviously there's there's more to yeah. it as well. So yeah. you talk about increasing classical length, and I know Bill mentioned you guys are doing some long muscle length isometrics to failure. Yeah. But are you are you still using these, say traditional super maximal eccentrics? And is full range no. of strength training enough to also potentially elicit that? I mean, plyometrics as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, all of the above, really. Um, okay. And, and like the thing is, we don't really know um, enough to definitively say X, Y, Z. So you throw the kitchen mm. sink at it, see if you can get an adaptation. Because, you know, as you've alluded to already, people are doing, a, you know, a multitude of training variables. So if you want to push something, you've got to push it hard. Um, mm. And and I like the, and, 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 you, and then you play with the periodization. And, okay, well, you, you measure along the way. and what did we get out of that? Okay, well, they improved this. That was compromised. It's, you know, um, and I think you know, Bill Bill's doing quite a good job in terms of measuring um, a spectrum of things with with his athletes, the, the fight athletes that he's, that he's working with. And um, yeah, I'm mean, certainly not there yet. We don't know um, cause, it. and it's probably very individual. You know, you do one thing and I do another thing, or we do the same thing. We get different adaptations, different you know, genetic makeups, or whatever it is, or training histories, or you know, ages, or, or yeah, and all of these things that interplay, um, which is, yeah, there's always going to be an art to this stuff um, at some level. Yeah, for sure. Do, do you want to maybe go into some detail about these long long muscle length isometries? Kind of, maybe just maybe just some theoretical background about you know, how you got to, how you got to this point of implementing yeah. this and why. Yeah, so, yeah, to be perfectly honest, it was, uh, um, I used to do bobsay back in the day as it, as a um and a, and, a, and a, as a not very talented athlete that sort of had an opportunity, and um and so I was always looking for a you know and I but I was a pretty obsessed obviously I was doing a PhD and um in sports science in a related field um and, and sprint training detraining and 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 so I, you know but this is you know twenty five years ago and you know then the internet sort of came along and um all the <laughs> stuff sort of became available people training and I watched a guy there was a guy um. You know, Adam Archuleta, who who blew up the NFL combine in about two thousand and one, and there was a you know quite a few stories that came out on this guy, and he was a um, some guy from Arizona that um, you know it was kind of the, the, the ultimate story of that that untalented guy turns up and he does six years of training with this weird quirky trainer and he comes out <laughs> and he's Superman and he you know he ran a you know four three forty time he he had a you know thirty nine inch vertical jump and he could squat a house and he could bench press five hundred pounds. At, you know, so he's been fishing 230k at, at 100 at 100k, um, six foot guy. You know, so, so it was phenomenal um, athlete. And he was doing, anyway, anyway. Part of his training was this long duration isometric work. And the guy I tried to contact the, tra- the guy Jay Jay Schrader, who was the the, co- the trainer, mm. and he was, he was very elusive. Like, was it Eno Sport, right? Eno yeah, Sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Eno Sport. Yeah, and he was a very elusive guy. Wouldn't reply. I was like, oh yeah. And I sort of, but I, but I was kind of <laughs> this this kid had a much of it was basically exactly the same size as me at the time. And, um. And and he could beat me in everything. And I sort of, you know, <laughs> and I was like, shit, Bob's saying football, pretty similar in terms of these metrics. So I started thinking, well, maybe he's just on, he's just taking steroids or whatever. Could I do that stuff on steroids? I was like, no, nah, I still couldn't do it. I still couldn't bench 230K. <laughs> I still, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure I couldn't have. And maybe he was just more talented. Um, great. But maybe his training was interesting. Um, who knows? Anyway, but it sort of was, a, it just kept ruminating in my mind and never followed up at any level at that point. And then, Fast forward uh, 15, 16 years, um, a guy turns up at the, um, so one of my passions is multi, multi, multi-events training, so decathlon, the heptathlon, my wife's a heptathlete, um, I, I was a piss forward decathlete back in the day, 
<laughs> and um, so I was watching the, the Olympics, and the, a, a guy turns up, French guy turns up, uh, and I'd watch, I'd seen him watch, I'd followed this guy's career because my wife went to the 2012 Olympics, and he was at the 2012. He was, it was around. If he didn't qualify, he was, he was there or thereabouts as, as a young guy at 2012. <clears throat> but I looked at his score. He earned a cap on the ever said a series of events, but one of the prerequisites to being a great decap is you got to be able to run fast. And he was like 11.1 second hundred meter runner, and which is fast in normal people terms, but as elite decathlete terms, if you want to break the world record, you're probably going to be able to run at least 10 six in the hundred. And so I sort of like, he's, he's done a big score, but he's just really coordinated. He's got all the events sorted at 22, 21, or whatever it was. Uh, and I didn't think he was going to go anywhere. And fast forward four years, um, or five or six years, he comes out and he runs 110 five zero um, from 11 one at 22 to 22. And generally in, in athletics, um, people get to about 22 or 23 and they don't improve anymore. They get, they pretty much stagnate. They might improve a 10th or a second here or there, but don't improve. He's taken off six tenths of a second. I'm like, the hell's going on here anyway you get on his instagram page and lo and behold he's doing the same shit that this guy adam archuleta <laughs> was doing um 10 years earlier 15 years earlier i'm like oh my god this is the thing so I, I went down that rabbit hole i went and saw his coach um i ended up going to see jay schroeder i just just basically emailed him and ended up cold, just turned up and um because he was very elusive and sort of deliberately um elusive i would say and uh, Jerome Simeon, who was the guy that was doing um, Kevin Meyer, the decathlete, um, yeah, he was a much more um, easy to get along with, really good guy, uh, really helpful. He'd actually been mentored to some level by Jay Schrader while he was living yeah. in the States. Now he's moved back to France, French guy, moved back to France. Um, and so it was all unraveled. And, and they, did, they did all these long duration isometrics, so five minute isometric holds, um, which, are, which are brutal in, the, in, these, in these very long muscle lengths. And, and you know, is there magic in the five minutes? No, I don't think there is. Um, is there? Do you have to go to fatigue? Um, not necessarily. But I think the thing with um, you know, this is kind of interesting. The thing with um, trying to improve sarcomeres and series, it seems to be more volume, more stress, more intensity, more mm. adaptation, which is unfortunately quite contrasting to the fiber type piece. So I think mm. if you if you push the um, sarcomeres and series to its natural optimum by stressing the shit out of it for months on end, you'd probably compromise five times the other way and then your your contractile adaptation might be reasonably nil because mm. the two things that counteract each other. Um, mm. That said, uh, in, a, in a fight sport context, at least you would maintain your contractile speed uh, despite doing all this conditioning work. Um, yeah. And also, and also, if you develop, if you're you know, stretching the crap out of something, you're developing length and rotation or flexion or whatever it is, um, in a in a in my in my brain in my context you, you you can if you can if I can if I try to generate force from here versus force from back here um, in, mm. in a rotational context obviously I can generate more impulse by going longer. If you're adding range to um to the system by by doing by improving your range while you're doing these long duration isometrics or loaded isometrics or full range eccentrics or whatever it is. Yeah, you might improve your impulse just by because you, you got more time on each impulse. And 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 you know, one of the one of the one of my mates here is a as a as a long drive golfer. Um, so you know, if you can get each degrees more of rotation in your you know in your, in your backswing, um, you have more time to produce impulse. Now, is that useful in the fight context? Maybe not when you're trying to you know really quickly get in and jet. So again, all these things. If you understand them mechanistically, you can sort of make a, an informed decision as to whether it's useful in your context, I suppose. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's interesting. What, what exercises are you using? Because you mentioned, uh, I think there's the long duration, like isometric split squat or lunge with the, yep. with the legs. Yep. Are you are you doing one for rotation there? So you can, yeah, you can do it with rotation. I, I just put a bar on the shoulders, full full range, and then just try and press into it. Um, so oh, like, so you got the bar the, like a, over act. Against the, against the power act or something like that. Yeah, we do okay. that. Okay. So you can do that for long duration, or you can do it for rate of force development too. So you could do it like one thing, mm. or you could do it for just holding it, holding it, holding it. Um, yeah. We do side bends, uh, like on a forty-five degree back extension bench, yeah. like a side bend um, with you know, maybe with a kettlebell in your hand, just you hang onto that. Yeah, uh, we do, we do hanging, we do um, push up hold through, with, yeah, yeah, parallelettes, whatever parallelettes, um, try to get full range. Yeah, I mean you you're kind of limited by your imagination. You can do. Um, you can do stuff for the quads. You can do, um, yeah, I guess, and there are some that I think, 
couple that I that I would warn against perhaps. We've had a couple of guy that was doing um full flexion sort of piked um ISO hold for hamstring length. And mm. end up getting um a sort of insertional sort of um well, origin really, um tendonitis in the in the hamstring tendon. So that was one. And I think you probably have the same thing if you try to get calf length. You know, when you when yeah. you go into a full um straight leg, you know, sort of full, full dorsal flexion, you're actually pressing the, the the Achilles up against the calcane ass and, and, and you're you're getting tendons don't like that sort of pressure or anything. So then you get these tendonitis issues and then so some of them you gotta you gotta um and, and yeah, certainly I've cocked some of these things up and, and, and probably injured athletes by, by doing the wrong thing. You know, when you when you when you you're trying to do the right thing obviously, but you you, you don't think through all that the implications sometimes and um yeah, so sorry for any athletes that I've done that to. But, um, <laughs> I think we're I think we've all gone through that. <laughs> we've yeah, had sacrificial well, yeah. lambs as as we yeah. as we go, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What the what's the no sport stuff then? Is it uh, DB Hammers? What the best training book you ever? Oh well, yeah, it's called. Is that yeah. have you uh, applied any of that? Because I read that and I was like, this is way over my head. I can't even understand the damn language he's using. Yeah, well that's right, and I think there was a um, I've got a copy of that and. You know, it's essentially auto, auto regulation was the, was the main principle in that that you um you, you give it X amount of stress and then you you have X amount of recovery in terms of days off prior post that stress and and there seemed to be a whole lot of gaps that weren't filled in necessarily in that book in my mind and, and as you say it was deliberately um yeah what was it deliberately I don't know certainly the, the language was it was almost like trying to read something in a foreign language wasn't it like they changed all the <laughs> yeah. terms that you were familiar with from you know, a traditional sports science literature and they sort of, um, it was just super frustrating to read. Um, we had tried um, I, I, some of the principles whether I, whether I got it right. And I, and I you know, you've got to give um, those guys credit. I think that, you know, they, 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 they did a bit of stuff. There was a guy on super training. There used to be a, a chat group, super training, that, um, that Mel Siff had set up 20 or 30 years ago. And um, the guy, D.B. Hammer, whoever who that hell he was, seemed to back up some of his um, stuff by, Training somebody there that was well trained and, and getting personal bests out of them, um, so yeah, I think there is something in it. Um, it it's, it's complicated in our environment when you have, if you're not the coach, there's all these other competing demands on their time, their, mm. their energy, technical. If, if I'm doing the conditioning, somebody's doing the technical piece, or well, the technical piece is not without its loading. Measuring uh, in power sports, particularly measuring load in, in and of itself, is difficult. Yeah, you, know, you can't just. So what, what happened to your heart rate? I was like, well, that's not really the, the point of strength training or power training. And so, yeah, I kind of understand. Did, did we do it perfectly? No. Um, is it a bad idea? No, it's a, it's a good idea. If you, if you can auto-regulate appropriately, I mean, that's the golden goose. And I think AI will help in that space um, mm. going forward. Yeah, if it doesn't take over the world and kill us all first, it'll be, uh, <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's some bits and pieces there that, um, yeah, will be amazing, potentially. Mm. Oh, awesome. I'd love for you to also go into... Uh... I guess uh, as a follow on from this, this fascicle and stuff is just the idea, well, not the idea, but eccentric training. Because yourself, yep. you're on a paper with, with Jamie Douglas yep. well, eight years ago or so now. That's probably one of the yep. best, pa- best papers on eccentric training there is the chronic one. I think there's a Q and a chronic one. Yep. Maybe yep. maybe let's go into, we could go super basic and just overarching with it as well. Just you know, why should or shouldn't someone start to incorporate eccentric training into their, into their training as a fighter? And maybe mm-hmm. what eccentric training maybe is or isn't, because there might be some misconceptions around, you know, if I'm just slowing down the tempo, is it still eccentric training? Yeah, so I don't, I don't conclude, I wouldn't call that eccentric training if I'm doing, you know, one second up, two seconds down, slowly controlled eccentric mm-hmm. or five seconds down. That's just, yeah, I don't think, I, don't, I wouldn't call that eccentric training. I, I call it eccentric training because the, the people are not aware that with the force velocity curve, um, most people are aware of the concentric side of the force velocity curve and that, when you move really fast, you can't push much load. And when you move really slowly or isometrically, yeah, you can produce a, a truckload of force. And that's all well and good. And, and the thing, um, and so, you know, to work power, you need to work light or to high speed power, you need to work light, et cetera, et cetera. The beautiful thing with eccentric training and why it is a unique stimulus is it's the only way you can simultaneously get high speed and high load. Because if you look at, if you look online and you see the, the, um, the force velocity curve, you know, it, it, there is a, um, you know, force doesn't go down as you go eccentrically, it goes up. And it keeps mm. going up modestly uh, at high speed, at higher speeds. 
And so you can simultaneously get this high speed, high force, uh, which is this really potent training stimulus. And so for that alone, it does give you a unique stimulus, and that's, that's awesome. I guess the other thing in a, in a fire context or almost any sort of running, jumping, um, you know, loading for a strike, um, the best athletes usually can absorb force the quickest and then explode out of it really quickly. And, and we see this, there's a lot of stuff, you know, people have talked about this, um, you know, Carl Dietz and the triphasic training, all those guys that have sort of slapped this around, the Russians talked about it, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, but, and it, but it's a thing, like the people that absorb force quickly, and, and even um, the sprint training literature from the 80s, the Hacken and Kaimi, they, they showed the elite guys mm. when they run over force plates, they're breaking, the elite guys versus sub-elite guys in the sprinting, they're, um, they spend a r- roughly the same amount of time on the ground, but the elite guys might spend, so if they, let's say they had 100 milliseconds on the ground, I'm giving you the numbers slightly wrong here, but the elite guys might spend 40 milliseconds absorbing the force, 60 milliseconds producing it. Sub-elite guys might spend 50 milliseconds absorbing and 50 milliseconds producing a force, concentrically. So advantage to the elite guys, they saw force more quickly and had more time to produce it. And so same thing with, and, 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 you know, if you're loading to try a punch, if you can get and, and just come out of it really quickly, hey, it's harder, it's harder to read, it's, hard, it's probably faster, um, there's more time to, to produce it. Um, so, so yeah, so you want, in my mind, you want eccentric strength because it, 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 it's kind of the golden goose. Eccentric training will give you um, sarcomers and serious, more so than um, concentric training, it would appear. Um, it, and, and fast eccentric training gives you high stress um, and, and high load, high, high velocity simultaneously. And the fastest centric training in one or two papers has shown a shift in fiber type towards this high speed contractile protein, you know, mm-hmm. minus two X myosin. And so it's like, well, holy shit, this is this is the golden goose. The the problem with it, um, now I'm rambling a bit, so you can stop me if you want no, me to. Keep going, keep going. Um, <laughs> the problem with it is, it's incredibly stressful. And so in this sort of acute space, you do this eccentric training, and you know, eccentric training is famous for giving you DOMS. And muscle soreness, um, impairing contractile qualities for the next 24, 48, sometimes days and weeks on end, that will impair your performance. <laughs> and so you, you jump into it ill prepared and you compromise your athlete's performance for a week, two weeks. They think it's shit and um, never to be done again. Oh, that didn't work. It was shit. And it, what was shit was, you know, you, the provider, was shit because you did too much too early. And you didn't give them time to adapt, and 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 that. so, yeah. Certainly, there there are papers when you, when you when you stress the crap out of people, like thirty days later, they still haven't got they still haven't recovered from eccentric loading because <laughs> of the damage and some. So this this is a legitimate thing, and so again, it, it's one of these things where there's there's a um, there's a an art and a and a nuance to to providing an appropriate stimulus for this given athlete, and you know you're going to get it wrong. We've all got it wrong. We'll overcook it, overcook it, undercook it. You know, like. And it's finding that sweet spot where you can get the adaptation um, in an ideal world. You know, if you're trying to try and find, make somebody super powerful, um, and, and then periodize it so that they maintain those adaptions for a period of time into the lead up to their comp. And, um, and the other, the other kind of crazy thing is that if you uh, you do this essential training, you add sarcomeres and series, you pay, maybe, maybe you improve fiber type, and then you start freshening up for a comp so you can actually fully express those contractile adaptations. Yeah. If you take it out altogether, within about a month, you lose all those sarcomeres and series that you had. You lose them. They're gone. And so it's like, oh, shit. So that, and it might take you a month to freshen up. It's like, oh, God, how, how do I figure, you know, this is, and, and yeah, I, but interesting, yeah, there's, a, there's a paper, I think it's um, Prislin Nadal, 2018, maybe. Um, but they showed that in, in a Nordic example, which has obviously been a pop- popular um, stimulus for mm-hmm. training, eccentric training, I think it was one, Eight reps a week, so two sets of four over a week, which is, you know, three fifths of not much, um, <laughs> is enough to maintain fasciculing. Okay, so you don't need to do much, but you need to tap the wheel. You need to just do um, a little bit of work in your tapering period. Once you've done, you've, you've cemented these big adaptations by high stress, high load, you know, base training. Okay, then you've got to keep tapping the wheel through to your competition. Uh, to maintain the fascicle length, but only do a little bit, so you're still promoting fiber type and the rest and the overshoot as well. And I mean, all these things are interacting. It's like it's a moving feast. Isn't <laughs> it? Um, 
but yeah, kind of kind of cool um, how that all yeah. how that all interacts and um, yeah. So how how are you progressing? That then are you starting with say slow, e- accentuated eccentrics and then moving to faster eccentrics? Yeah. So um, yeah, it, it depends again on the athlete how where they're at and their their, mm. their athlete life cycle. Um, if they uh, slow slow eccentrics, I, yeah. If they've got good control and they've got good movement and they and they are confident, I would say, I would say slow, but I wouldn't go. I wouldn't be. I don't. I wouldn't even. I don't ever do the. I used to, but I don't ever do now. I don't see the value in it. Um, the the, the tempo based eccentrics down yeah. when it's not overblown. Um, so we'll go. We'll do some tr- traditional lifting. Get through. Yeah, you know, they might be do two three weeks of traditional lifting. Get, if they've had a break, break, get back into their training block. This is for a mature athlete, and then we'd go straight into the accentuated piece. Um, now would we push the the velocity um, not necessarily from the start but later on and we've got a couple of motor driven devices which can help us drive the eccentric velocity and the cool yeah. thing with that stuff is it gives you feedback in terms of the force and you know it, it's it's really really apparent that that force velocity curve is real like you, you go high speed force doesn't go down it keeps going up and it's like holy shit this is real this is this is this and that's why this unique stimulus in it. and and I, I think um yeah, so my, my my words of caution are that it does it does do damage. It will impair performance in the in the short term, but it will enhance it in the longer term. Um, you need to be prepared to weigh that out and or yeah. not overcook them straight away. Um, because yeah, you can you can injure somebody with these entry training. Like it's genuinely um, so so yeah, a little bit of a little bit conservative initially. You're better off underdoing it than overdoing it, and then yeah, you, mm. you sort of learn how they adapt and how they respond, and yeah. Um, you know the rest, and it's uh. Yeah, the, yeah, it's... I had an extra fly in the garage, and oh, yeah. I was obviously doing a lot of motorized stuff. I was like, the the owner was lived one one suburb over from me back home in in Auckland, yep. so yep. that's how we got connected up and used all the stuff. And I was I was playing around a lot with the motor there, but obviously for most people, they don't have eccentric motors and flywheels. So yep. how how would you then prescribe say fast eccentric training, like drop catch variations or something like that? Yep. Top catch variations, you know, you can do, um, you know, some of the two up, one down stuff, and like in the leg press or, or whatever might mm. be a, might be a viable mm. thing. But but certainly the altitude drops, drop stick, you know, um, push up, jump, lunge, mm. um, all of those are really viable options. And, and I think, um, you you know, like we we were look one of the, one of the shop owners I work with, we we did a lot of stuff, and we we got all these cool devices, and it it helps a little bit, you know. But we were doing all this primitive stuff. Manual, if somebody pushes the yeah. overload and all this other stuff, you can do a lot without anything. You know, you don't need mm-hmm. all that stuff. So, so the, 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 you know, the drop, if you do a whole lot of altitude drops, jumping off a, you know, five foot box and sticking a, you know, parallel squat landing, you're going to get DOMS and you're going to get adaptation. And um, I, I guess the thing with some of those ones, if you go straight into that without any preparatory <laughs> stuff, yeah. yeah, the tendon stress and all that other stuff is, is probably going to be too high. You're going to get injured. So, oh, you're goodbye knees. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so you have to be. Um, everything is progressive, and everything probably takes longer than people want it to take. And we're, uh-huh. you know, we're probably quite a Western world. We're probably pretty impatient, you know. And, and so, then you get injured, and then it's a setback, and it's like, yeah, take your time, take your time, <laughs> do sensible progressions, um, and take a bit longer than you think you should take. I mean, I, I was the worst. I was this I'm type A idiot. That when I was an athlete, I would break myself every two months, and then. It's a rehab, and like I was a moron, absolute moron. <laughs> and and you know, I look back on it now, I think as a, as a more, somewhat more mature, I hope, um, human, <laughs> like that, 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 and I was you know, largely self coached for a lot of my time. Is yeah. and you know, you make all those mistakes, and it's probably been good for me to make all those mistakes. And um, as a coach, you don't but, make them with but, the athletes, then because well, you don't do know it, yourself. Not as much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, yeah, I feel yeah. you with that. The, yeah. Um, and you talked about recently as well. It was on the, I think it was on the Just Fly podcast. I don't listen to many strength coaching podcasts. But when you're on on these ones, I, I tend to tune in. And you talked about this. Uh, talked about the speed ball. Oh yeah, making yep. people more explosive. And I was like, what the heck? like? How are you? Yeah, I'm just gonna so, let you go with it. <laughs> yeah. So, so speed ball is not my idea. It's it's it came from um, <clears throat> the Scot- Scottish professional sprinters, and they used to do um. So that you know, you live in Scotland and Glasgow somewhere, and, and it's freezing cold, and they. You, you got a <laughs> shitty little garage to train in in the winter because it's, you know, raining sideways outside and it's two degrees or whatever. And so a guy called Jim Bradley um, came came upon this idea that they would, they you know, 
yeah, the traditional boxing speed ball, speed bag, I think the Americans call it. Um, they, they do, so they start doing these three minute rounds, you know, very boxing like three minute rounds on speed ball. And so I do think, and, and what happened was, you know, long story short, his guys came out the next season and ran really fast. And everybody's like, hell. And, and so <laughs> mechanistically, what the hell's going on there? And I don't think they had, they, I, I don't think they figured out what was going on. They just knew it worked. And so I tried it with, um, my wife was at 38 or so. She decided she was going to make, come back and do um, some triple jump just for, just for fun. Uh, she was a hip they never ran a triple jump. She had two kids and um, we had, she had a bit of a sacrum, you know, pelvic floor wasn't what it was perhaps. And sacrum was playing up and we got to the bit. She had about a month of traditional sort of strength training, weight training, running training. Uh, take him, gave out, couldn't train. And she well, she couldn't do weights. Um, she couldn't bound. She couldn't sprint. And she wanted to do triple jump. So, oh, this is a bit of a test. <laughs> and so so we thought, oh, let's, let's just go. So we did speedball. We did speedball and um, isometric holds, long duration isometric holds. Mm -hmm. And she came out at 38 and ran as fast as she'd ever run in a, in a flying time trial through through lights, um, as fast as she'd ever run for yeah, faster than she'd run 20 years. Wow. And on 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 three months of hitting a hitting a bloody speedball, and so anyway, it's a real long story, but um, started playing with a few other people. A few other people did really well with it, um, and there's there's a whole lot. There's a, I'm not quite sure mechanically. I have some theories, and and I think if you're hitting a speedball, essentially you're going in your body when you, and part of it is fatigue. Like you do speedball, I can simply be very stiff and just hit it with my arms, and it's like. Like I'm, I'm not a swimmer, and if I go if I go for a swim, and I swim 50 meters, by the time I've done 50 meters, my feel, feel like my delts are yep. going to explode, and I'm just I'm Same very <laughs> yeah I'm very not pretty in the water, just a thrashing <laughs> machine. And speedball is the same. You can hit it for about a minute, and then you feels like your delts are going to explode, and you have to start using your body. And so you start doing this, you know, and you and you can feel your feet connecting to the floor, and you're using your body, and there's this connection. And and what's going on there? You're training your truck, um, you're training connection, you're doing, yeah, in, in a three minute round, you might be doing 600, 700 hits on the speedball. So it's a lot of um, contraction. And I wonder whether you'll start, start laying down these fascial slings um, that take time. And so, so metabolically, six times three minute rounds has obviously got nothing to do with running 100 meters, you know, nothing, 10 second <laughs> event versus, um, but. But maybe it's not metabolic that we're looking at. Maybe it's these whole fascial slings. Maybe it's the core. Yeah, the, the whole idea of um, my spinal engine is another road I went down, which is the idea that the trunk controls the pelvis. The pelvis controls the legs. And the legs, are, you can walk on your pelvis without your legs. Yeah, you, can, you, you see those people doing those sort of butt shuffles on, on the ground. Well, you walk, that's walking on your pelvis, t driven entirely by your trunk. You're hip hitching, and it looks very much like walking. The legs are just there to increase the amplitude of your hip hitching. Which would then mean the trunk would be this really key part of, of running fast. So I was like, okay. Um, so there's all these things that interplay, and there's the contract relax of the speed ball. You're telling you, you you're sending these new neural signals on off on off on off. Um, so there's a whole lot of things at play. Um, but it does it, it. It makes certainly makes people run fast. I'm not sure it makes you generically more explosive, um, but people run fast out of it. And, and and perhaps even the other thing is, you know, if you think if you think. It, it depends what lens you put on it, doesn't it? This, this, this is what's cool about this sort of stuff. Like <laughs> you think about, we just talked about overshoot, and so essentially you're in the you're your son Scotsman and doing professional spinning in Glasgow, and it's freezing cold. You haven't got an indoor track. You spend three months not running, right? Because you're hitting speedball. Are you getting overshoot in your legs? Mm. Probably. And then your prime movers, you know, one some of your prime movers, maybe you're shifting the the, the muscle to a faster contractile protein. You come in, I don't know. There's a million. There's a million potential ways to interpret <laughs> what's going on there, but certainly in a speed context, yeah, it's just I, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, that is very interesting. You took the, the spinal in. I guess spinal engine may be a little buzzword now around and around fascial slings and things like that. Do you think that a lot of traditional strength training can almost shut that down, make you make you quote unquote stiff and rigid, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I think. Um, and I, I'm, I'm certainly not bagging traditional strength training in terms of, I think, mm -hmm. you know, having mm -hmm. some, some grunt is a really useful thing. Yeah. Um, but you still need to be able to move well. And, you know, like, you see good athletes and they don't, they don't come in moving like a robot, you know? 
they move and there's a bit of swagger and there's a bit of bounce and, and that whole thing is yeah they're using it trying to, to and they're using this most efficient system and i think yeah. you know some of it's strength training sometimes uh, and, I, and i bet it's the same in, in, in martial arts that that if you over coach somebody you know you do it like this and it's got to be this perfect um yeah rather than just letting them do their thing and their joints will be a bit different your joints their movement might not be the same as yours and, and certainly you see people that are over coached and, and sprinting um you know it just doesn't look it looks forced and it doesn't look rhythmic and doesn't bounce and it's like yeah we're, we're not we're not a um you know we're not this is, we're not a, a robot we're not a biomechanical model just from a we have all these different elastic systems within the system um that need to bounce and be rhythmic and yeah it's it's cool it's it's cool when it's complicated and that's why it's fun <laughs> you know like um, yeah i sure as shit don't have all the answers but but so you look at these things and you and you sort of see different stuff and um especially when you see yeah. uh like strength sports athletes and bodybuilders walk around or you go like like what i did like i used to i grew up soccer tennis rugby yep. played it all yep. and then got into olympic weightlifting as my main sport for many right. years and yep. since then like 100 percent like lost that ability to rotate well definitely yep. have that stiffness through the spine like and it's like damn i actually got to regain it because i wasn't yep. i wasn't doing it i was lifting five times a week just trying to get better at snatching cleaning gym you know yeah yep. Yeah, mm. and and, and, like, and yeah, that's it. It's advantageous not to move, you know. So exactly. You, you just, yeah. Yeah. So you, and um, I mean, it's, it's cool. Like, the thing with people that the whole fascial piece too is like people people don't always get that fascia adapts along lines of stress, you know. So babies don't have a plant of fascia in their feet because they don't mm. walk on their feet. You know, we have plant fascia because we walk on it every day. We put force through this thing, and they, and we're trying to get this elastic system that's, that helps us give us some economy. And so if you're a, if you're a fighter and you don't do a drills, you don't move much, you don't um, you won't you won't have any economy because you haven't developed these. You know, I, I think you know a very good coach wants it to be fashion develops through repetition, and you know so the whole idea of you know Bruce Lee doing ten thousand kicks a day or whatever he was supposed to have done, like all those things are there's method in that madness. You know that that um, mm. that, that they they are developing not just the muscle, not just the motor pattern. But this elastic system that helps them repeat it. Mm. So, no, so yeah. Okay, that actually connect, cool. uh, connects some dots around the fascia. Because I think that actually, when people, well, when I mean, some people talk about fascia, it's almost seen as like this isolated thing that you're training. So people talk about, you know, yeah. it's fascial training versus like muscle training. So I mean, yeah, yeah. and you know, that's that, that, an isolation. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. No, that's <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. and it kind of irritates me that stuff like. We're a system. Mm -hmm. We're a system multitude with a multitude of systems within it. But you can't isolate. You can't move without using your fascia or your muscle or your nerves. Mm. They're all engaging these things. And, and so yeah, um, yeah, you might slant the emphasis a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to do things elastically, you might be yeah, the fascial stuff might be a bit more of it. But but I don't think we know well enough um, because I, I think the scanning technology, the high res ultrasound, and all that sort of stuff. I'm not sure it's at a point yet where we can actually discern that okay we did this program strength training for six months what happened to the fascia adaptations okay then we did a one of you know ballistic leg swings okay what happened then then we did mm. um yoga for a month what well, yeah I, I don't know that we have that ip to be able to definitively say x causes y you know w causes mm. z you know I, <laughs> I i don't know that we have that and and uh yeah i think we we maybe get there um and i think that'll be that'll be the next generation of some research in that space would be kind of cool, and um, and obviously coaches are playing with different things, and but some of these um, old truisms from sport that that have worked have worked for a reason, you know, and and I think mm. um, yeah, and I think you know in a lot of, a lot of martial arts world there is repetition is a thing, isn't it? Like people do a lot of reps, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, well maybe that's not stupid. Mm. So yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm, it, it is very interesting. Yeah. Would well, you say that that training then get Maybe there's a little more emphasis towards, say, the elastic fascia. I mean, that's just your simple then plyometric training, jumps, throws, et cetera. And then yep. obviously your more quote unquote muscular driven stuff, squats, bench, whatever. That yep. would be that would be like your fascia versus, say, muscular yeah. and, training. And, and can, can you can you combine like skipping, for example? You know, you do you know, yeah. boxing, skipping, you know, salon or something. And, you know, I think th there's a lot of um, repetition, uh, speedball. Mm. Speedball skipping with the upper body in some ways, isn't it? Like, um, yeah, this repetition, and and so so I think those things, um, the elastic bouncing through high repetition stuff, um, you know, it can be high force, it can be the plyometric high force stuff, or it could be the high rep stuff. Yeah, um, 
what's the difference in the adaptation? Don't know. Um, the hiring stuff's interesting too because I had uh, Gary Hutt from GB Boxing on, on here I, a little while ago. And he said, yeah, these guys come in with no form of C background. Obviously, there's joke. I'm amateur boxers just jumping yep. a lot of rope and doing boxing and hitting like 4.0 RSIs. Yeah. With, yeah. I, with I, no background, I yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I just, from, just from high, I guess from high rep bouncing around and just a lot of volume yep. bouncing. Yeah. yeah. So they've got these very efficient, um, yeah, very efficient systems. Like they, they, they're tendons and their fascia, it's all nicely connected. And it's like mm. you, maybe you give them a shitload of strength training and the RSI goes down. Yeah. You can see yeah. that. Because um, all of a sudden, because all of a sudden, and sometimes it's the, um, What's a Bob? There's a paper, quite a famous paper, Bobbitt and Van Zoist from like 1994. It was a it was a simulation paper of, of junk, and sometimes and basically what they showed was, they, you know, again I'll get the numbers wrong, but they 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 had a six muscle model vertical jump on a computer simulation essentially, and they so they you know had inputted all these strengths into all these muscles, and and they had a vertical jump came out. So let's say, yeah, yeah, you had it. You put all these different strength nut metrics in and you came out and you had a 60 centimeter vertical jump. Now you improve all those strength metrics by 20%. Put them into the same algorithm and the vertical jump actually goes down, which is fascinating. Hmm. 20% stronger, <laughs> vertical jump goes down. But then you reorganize the algorithm because the ratios are all slightly different now and, it's just, and you reorganize it and then, you, then, it, then it improves the vertical jump. And I think what that said to me was if you don't practice the skill a long time alongside the strength development, and you change mm -hmm. the you change the engine without changing the motor program. Um, sometimes you can impair performance despite the potential for performance being higher. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. And I think that whole um, the facial piece is, is yeah is another another sort of sub point in that space that um, you improve the spring stiffness or you improve the elasticity and or you don't you, you change the muscle and or you don't change the spring stiffness. Maybe performance goes down despite the potential being higher and, and it's yeah, I mean, um, that's what I think. That's what I think. It's interesting. It's about, you have to, um, you got to figure it all out and, and um, get it wrong, and then you get it right, and um, yeah, it's kind of cool. Nah, I love that. I know you got you got to jump in and start coaching now, Angus. Where can people uh, yeah. find and follow you and keep up with what you're doing? Like, well, I'm not very good on social media. I don't really care about <laughs> it. So, I'm, I, you're probably hard pressed to find me. But I'm always happy to. to yeah, you know, I'm not really on social media at any level. I um. I'm I'm on Twitter, but I don't really post anymore. Um, I just read stuff from time to time. Not on my wife. My my wife made me account on an account. I don't even know how to get into it on Instagram. Um, so, I'm, so I'm, don't follow I'm, you there. <laughs> don't follow me there. Um, yeah, look. Um, the best bet is just give me if you if you want to if you want to touch base. I'm not touch base. I'm yeah, one on one is much easier anyway. Um, and and it sort of sorts out the people that are truly interested or not or just you know. So if it, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe I'll, I'll reply to emails. If I don't reply to email, email me again. It just means I'm busy and I've read it. Well, I'll get back to that on a date. So, um, but yeah, um, but my emails, yeah, easy to find online. It's helpful to New Zealand. So, yeah, yeah, I'll link I'll link it down in the description too for anyone. But I appreciate you coming cool. on, Angus, and sharing everything. No, because no, God, always a pleasure. Always good to talk. You always get ideas from other people. So, um, yeah, it's good.